This is he who came in water and in blood, Jesus Christ, not in the water only, but in the water and in the blood. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Now these words of today's epistle, the Apostle St. John, give us an indication of the image of the divine mercy of our Lord, where we see the water and the blood. This is something that's very, very important as we'll reflect upon today on the Feast of the Divine Mercy. But first we'll talk about two uh, very important men uh, that we find in Scripture. The first, St. Peter, and the other, Judas. One of them was a great saint, our first pope. The other was a son of perdition, condemned to hell for all eternity. Now why are we looking at both of these men? Well, both of them denied our Lord. When our Lord was betrayed, St. Peter was afraid. And because of this fear, not only did he deny him once, but he denied our Lord three times, once by an oath and another by cursing. But after his resurrection, our Lord showed him mercy because he repented of his sin. Now, St. Leo, commenting on this, says, quote, Blessed tear is a holy apostle, which had the virtue of holy baptism in washing off the sin of thy denial. I'll say that again. He said, Blessed tears, a holy apostle, which had the virtue of holy baptism in washing off the sin of thy denial. So his tears, his repentance, was washed away his sins and gave him this uh, holy baptism. Now, after his denial, St. Clement tells us that St. Peter was ever after accustomed to watch in prayer, pouring forth a flood of tears and bitterly weeping over his heinous crime. Now, by his prayer and his repentance, St. Peter showed his trust in God's mercy. Now, it sounds odd at first, but it's because of his prayers and his repentance that he showed trust in God's mercy. Very important things to look at in St. Peter. Now, this is the same mercy he would have shown to Judas. But Judas trusted too much in himself, and so he didn't look for our Lord. Remember, after he committed his crime, he went himself back to the Sanhedrin. He threw the money down and says, I've turned over innocent blood. He wanted them to do something about it because he was trying on his own. He didn't go to our Lord to ask for forgiveness. He didn't go to him in repentance. Yes, he was sorry for what he did, but he tried to fix it himself. He didn't reach out to our Lord's mercy. Now, the church fathers tell us that Judas had sorrow in his heart, but from that sorrow he didn't look for mercy, but only for more sorrow until it drove him to despair. So he was going over his sin, his crime, and it kept going over in his mind till it drove him to despair. But had he desired God's mercy, he would have found it, who said, I desire not the death of the sinner. Close quote the church fathers. And so the ancient fathers all agree, quote, if Judas had had recourse to sincere repentance and not to the halter, that is the rope, there was mercy in store even for the traitor. Close quote, the ancient church fathers. So both of them denied our Lord, St. Peter and Judas. But why did one become a saint and the other damned for all eternity? What separates these two men? Mercy. One repented and received mercy. The other never even bothered to ask for it or even put his trust in our Lord's divine mercy. That's why one is a saint and the other one is in hell. Now, what about us in our approach to God's mercy? Do we ask him for mercy? Or do we say, I can't be forgiven. What I've done is way too serious. My sins are too much. Now, if we say this, this isn't humility, but it's in fact pride. Because what we're saying is that a creation of man, a sin, sin is a creation of man. God didn't create it. A creation of man is much more powerful than God. God didn't create sin. So we're saying that one, a thing that I created is much more powerful than what God could create. 
Now, God can't create anything evil. And sin is an effect of our own free will. God only creates good. And he can only create things that are good because he's all good. This is why God creates only good. So God created us with a free will. This free will is good. He does this because he's good. And he wants us to love him out of our free will so we can have the freedom to love him. This is what free will is there for. God doesn't want to bind us to love him, but he wants us to be free to love him. And this is why he created us with a free will. Sin isn't more powerful than God. But God created something even more powerful than sin. Now, sin is obviously something that we create. But God created something more powerful. He called it mercy. Mercy destroys sin. It destroys evil. And it will destroy our vices and any wicked bondage that hell might have over us. Mercy is powerful. But most importantly, mercy will lead us to holiness, to sanctity, and finally to the kingdom of heaven. You see, the devil hates the mercy of God. There's none of that left for him. He doesn't know how to practice it. He can't practice it because mercy comes from love. So speaking of this creation of God, of mercy, what is it? What is mercy? Well, let's look at the words of the great uh, doctrine church father, St. Augustine. He says, quote, Mercy is a heartfelt sympathy for another's distress, impelling us to help him if we can. Now let's put these words to our Lord. Mercy is a heartfelt sympathy for another's distress. So our Lord is looking at our distress our sin, our fallen human nature, impelling us to help him if we can. So God is impelled to help us. This is clear how much he wanted to help us by his crucifixion, his death. That's why the novena of the divine mercy begins on Good Friday. He wants to help us. This is mercy. And of course, St. Augustine of all people knows what mercy is because he received the divine mercy of God, which gave him the grace to repent from his wicked and sinful lifestyle to become not only a great saint, but also a doctor and a father of the church. This is what mercy does. It turns sin into a great saint, into a great doctor and a teacher in the church. The powers of hell are helpless against mercy because it comes from love. Now, if we want God's mercy, first of all, we have to show mercy because that's the way God set it up. We have to show mercy. Now, it doesn't mean that we start off. God has already entitled us to mercy because he gives it to us. But we have to forgive. There's absolutely no way around it. We have to forgive. That's where it begins with us, for, with mercy. Our Lord said, Blessed are the merciful, merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So how do we do that? How do we practice this mercy that God shows to us? Well, because it comes from Christ, we have to look to him and his best friends, the saints. So we look to Christ to imitate him and imitate his saints, especially the martyrs. They loved God. They loved their neighbors. They even had enemies, of course, and they forgave their enemies, though. That's the key. They had mercy on their enemies. Our Lord taught us to even love our enemies. He said, but I say to you, love your enemies Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that persecute you and calumniate you and speak all kinds of evil against you. This our Lord taught, but then he did it. During his passion, our Lord was falsely accused. He was called a liar and a blasphemer. Witnesses brought up all kinds of calumnies and detractions against him. He was scourged, spit upon, mocked and ridiculed. Then he was crucified, nailed to a cross, on which he hung for three hours until he died. Now, why did he do all this? All Obviously to redeem us, but for one more reason. To teach us how to be merciful, even to our enemies. See, our Lord never stopped asking for mercy for his enemies. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. This is what he's asking. 
So we have to be merciful. We have to forgive everyone, even our enemies, everyone. Now we can exercise mercy through our actions, through our words, through our prayers, by performing any of the spiritual or corporal works of mercy. Now obviously the corporal works of mercy, just to familiarize ourselves with them, are feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting the imprisoned, visiting the sick and burying the dead. But the spiritual works of mercy, which are of higher value because they're spiritual, admonish the sinner, instruct the ignorant, counsel the doubtful, comfort the sorrowful, bear wrongs patiently, forgive all injuries, and praying for the living and the dead. These are all acts of love, and so they're all acts of mercy. But today, especially, the Feast of the Divine Mercy of God, God especially wants to show us His mercy. Now, the Lord told St. Faustina, He said, I demand from you deeds of mercy, which are to arise out of love for me. So He's demanding works from us, which come out of love. You are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or excuse or absolve yourself from it. Close quote, our Lord to St. Faustina. So our Lord said these things, but then he also gave us the requirements on this feast of divine mercy, of how we are to obtain this divine mercy. Well, we covered the first to be merciful to others through our actions, words, and prayers on their behalf. But the second is to celebrate this feast of the divine mercy on the Sunday after Easter, that is today. The third is to sincerely repent of our sins. We do that by going to confession. The fifth is to receive Holy Communion today. The sixth is we place our complete trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that if we pray to Him, He'll make us holy. He'll give us the grace for sorrow and a true contrition and for a good holy confession. And the seventh is to venerate the image of the divine mercy. So celebrate the feast on the Sunday after Easter, that's today. Repent of all our sins. Go to confession. Place our complete trust in God. Go to Holy Communion. Venerate the image of the divine mercy. And be merciful to others through our actions, words, and prayers on their behalf. Now our Lord said about this very day, the Feast of His Divine Mercy. He said, On that day the very depths of my mercy are open. Our Lord has opened His heart up to give us mercy. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. I'll repeat that. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened. Now, what our Lord means by those words, complete forgiveness of sins and punishment, is that all the temporal punishment, that is, all the things that we owe in purgatory after we die, or from this moment to the very beginning, the first sin we committed, All those are forgiven, and all the punishment due to those sins are completely wiped away. So it's almost like a brand new baptism. Our souls are completely wiped away. This is a promise given to us by our Lord himself to St. Faustina, a promise that he made. Now, the devil hates this devotion because it's greater than a plenary indulgence. He hates this devotion because it takes so many souls away from him. So he attacks it. Now, the heresy that militates or that goes against the mercy of God is the heresy of Jansenism. This heresy, as I said, denies the mercy of God. But there's two sides of the coin that we can fall on this. Because the her- we got the mercy of God, and you can deny the mercy by going in two directions. The first one is in the sin of pres- presumption. Where we say, I don't need God's mercy. I'm fine as I am. The other one is by despair. 
by just doing all these things and saying, well, I'm never going to be worthy and I'm never going to have God's mercy. And so it doesn't matter what we do, we'll never have God's mercy. And so we don't go to confession, we don't go to communion, and we just worry and we're, we're, our soul is in a state of panic. And even if we do go, you know, sometimes it may lead us to scrupulosity. But the, uh, the heresy of Jansenism basically uh, d- goes against the mercy of God, and so it falls into two areas, presumption and despair. But those that presume on God's mercy through the sin of presumption and think that we don't need it to get to heaven and we can do whatever we want and God is bound to save us, those will never merit from the mercy of God. It's the thinking or the error that says that God saves all men no matter what they do, even when they deserve hell. This is a heresy. It's an error. They say we don't need mercy, we can do it on our own. This is what's called universal redemption, and it's a heresy, and it's based basically on the sin of presumption, and it's a denial of the mercy of God. Now, we know that there are people that go to hell. In fact, many will go to hell. Our Lord had already told us. He said, broad is the way that leads to perdition, and many there are that go there. Narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and few there are who find it. Now, our Lord isn't doing this to lead us to despair, but to hope so that we get with the program. We follow those things to help us to get to heaven. So obviously not everybody makes it, so there is no universal salvation. But this great day, divine mercy, takes us away from despair. Because what despair takes us away from is hope. Now, it's true we see that our justice and the fear of hell provokes us to repentance. But the thing is, what we need now is mercy. We have an obscured view of God's mercy. That's why people are falling into the sins of presumption. That's why people are falling into sins of despair. So here's a quote that I've seen, and this is the argument. And I'll just quote as it's written verbatim. Quote, Divine mercy is centered around mercy. When mankind is coming closer and closer to having filled up the cup of divine justice. The problem today, of course, is that men don't fear God and continue to offend Him. They need to hear about His justice. But the divine mercy devotion was the perfect false devotion and message to help people believe that they receive God's mercy even if they stay in their sins. Close quote. Now I'll quote that last part again. The divine mercy devotion is the perfect false devotion and message to make people believe that they receive God's mercy even if they stay in their sins. Well, obviously, as we specified all the guidelines for divine mercy, nowhere in this devotion of divine mercy is God encouraging people to stay in their sins because part of the requirement is to go to confession. You know, So already there's something wrong there. And it's not a false devotion. It's been approved by the church And we have a canonized saint who backs it up. Now, St. Thomas will answer this attack. So I'll let a great uh, doctor of the church answer this. He said the following, quote, God acts mercifully, not indeed by going against his justice, but by doing something more than justice. So what St. Thomas is saying is mercy is more than justice. Thus a man who pays another 200 pieces of money though owing him only 100, does nothing against justice, and we'll all agree to that, but acts liberally or mercifully. The case is the same with forgiveness. Hence, it is clear that mercy does not destroy justice, but in a sense is the fulfillment thereof. You know, we look at this and we could say, well, what a surprise. You know, mercy is greater than justice. It perfects it. It fulfills it. But I'll add something to this. The reason why people don't return to God is that they don't recognize a need for His mercy. Or many don't think that they want His mercy. Many don't think they need God's mercy and they can get to heaven without repentance. The talk of justice doesn't necessarily inspire hope, hope of repentance and salvation, that is, but God's divine mercy does inspire hope. This is because they see a loving Father who's willing to take them back. This inspires us more heroically to love God. This is why we have the example in Holy Scripture, St. Mary Magdalene, where our Lord's, were, our Lord's words of Saint, uh, about St. Mary, Mary Magdalene were, she has loved much because much has been forgiven her. 
She saw a compassionate Savior. She went to Him, and her sins were forgiven. Secondly, this devotion emphasizes the fact that we need to repent and go to confession. That's why we need God's mercy. Because God gives us the grace for that repentance. Thirdly, there are tremendous miracles of grace that happen on this day. Many, many sinners who have fallen away from the church and the sacraments return and begin to live a holier life as a result of this very feast. Now, many may be inspired by the remnants of all temporal punishment that is all the time in purgatory. It doesn't matter. But the desire for this devotion, the desire of his mercy, is what pleases God the most. This is why he gave us this great day. But the thing is, many of the opponents of divine mercy, maybe they would like a feast of divine justice instead. I don't know, but to tell you the truth, I would prefer God's mercy. I know for myself I'm in no hurry for God's divine justice. I'll wait for the, uh, for the day that I die on that. But right now, I'll beg God for his mercy because I'm a sinner, and we need to beg him every day for his mercy. Now, some may even go so far as to complain that this devotion takes away from devotion to Christ the King. But that makes absolutely no sense. Why is that? Because the truth is, it doesn't take away from Christ as a king. It only strengthens his kingship and his power over Satan. What is more powerful than our Lord's mercy for sinners and the destruction of sin? Of course, I think we've clearly seen that already. So whenever we deny God's mercy, we end up in heresy. That is the Jansenistic heresy, whether by presumption or by despair. Now, this error causes us to lose hope, which are sins directly opposed to the theological virtue of hope. But divine mercy strengthens hope. This is why our Lord chose the words under the image that say, Jesus, I trust in thee. You see, our Lord loves us. He wants us to get to heaven. He came to show us mercy in this time where people don't need or they don't think they need God's mercy. They don't think they need repentance. He wants us to turn to Him in trust and in confidence so that we can take advantage of His loving offer of mercy. For our Lord Himself said, I have not come to call the just, but the sinners. So let us honor Him and let us honor His mercy today by repenting of all our sins, going to confession, placing our complete trust in our Lord, by going to Holy Communion, by venerating His image of divine mercy, by being merciful to others through our actions, through our words and prayers on their behalf. And let us trust in His divine mercy as the publican did, who in the Gospel of St. Luke's, we we hear that the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift his eyes towards heaven, but struck his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.